Hey, this is Landon, part of the City Church Media Team, here to share our big three announcements for the week. First up, don't forget to mark those calendars for March 3rd in our annual Share Conference. Dr. Dennis Jackson from Global Partners will be sharing insights that you won't want to miss. It's a day about living on mission and making every moment count. Next, our new student ministry for ages 9 to 13 has a game night coming up on February 23rd. 6.30 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. It's a night of board games and lots of fun. Bring five friends and come on out. See Pastor Joshua and Kirsten for more details. And don't forget to fill out your Connect cards. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for choosing to connect, grow, and share here with us at City Church Greenfield. Now let's get ready to worship. Calvary, there is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary. Come and be shameless, come and be fearless, come to the foot. next song that we will be doing is one that we've done a couple times before. A lot of times in our world today, there are things things like anxiety, depression. There are uh, addictions that people struggle with. If that's you, I'm glad you came here. If there's people that you know who are struggling with that, think about them as well. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to speak the name of Jesus over them. His name is Healing His name is power. His name is life. It can help overcome all of those things in those people's lives. So as we sing this prayer, let us think about those people that we know who are dealing with this. Knowing that it's only the name of Jesus who can actually help.
Because that is our word for missions. So our big idea, our big outgoing mission is that we connect together, we grow, and then we share. And so that's the share part of our mission. It's important that we connect together. It's important that we are bonding, that we are um, connecting with one another, holding each other accountable. It's important that we're growing, but it all leads towards 
the sharing. It's a foundational process. It's a step one, step two, step three. That doesn't mean that you don't share when you start connecting. It's not sure you're not good. It doesn't mean you don't grow when you're sharing. All those are all interconnected, like those three circles we did a few weeks ago. It all interconnects. But this part is where a lot of church members pause. This is where it gets to be a little more uncomfortable. It gets to be a little like, okay, it's good that I can come to church and sing some songs and hear a message and it's good for me, but now you're asking me to kind of get out of my comfort zone here and share my toys. Um, if you don't believe that we have a sin nature, just watch toddlers play it, right? What do they say? Mine! 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 My, our kids are five and six. And I, I tell you, there is, the, there is this thing I'm, I'm about to crap, crush. Like, I just want to take it into a, it's a small little baby Rubik's Cube. It's worth like $2. And it, I mean, they don't want to play with that thing at all until someone else picks it up. That's mine! You know, this huge thing. And I'm like, it's not yours. We actually bought it for you. You know, you, you, oh, you guys didn't even know it was there. It was under the couch next to the gum. And you found the dog brought it out, it's chewed up, and now you want it because he wants it or she wants it or whatever. And I'm like, oh my goodness. We all have that in us. So we have to battle that. I mean, somebody cried by screaming, sorry! Um, I still play, it's mine! Uh, we need to battle our fleshly desires of being selfish and turn that into being selfless. Why? Well, that's all today's message is about. Why? Yes, I'm talking about that. Why that we um, why we do what we do? We don't just say we do it. Sometimes we you know we say, all right, let's go do this, and we do it, but we forget to ask why, and we forget to teach other people why we're doing what we're doing. So today we're going to talk about that in general. We're going to be in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul's letter to the, the church in. Philippi, and we're going to start in chapter 2. Uh, it will be on the screen. Uh, we're also going to switch over to a, a verse in Matthew that will not be on the screen. Uh, it's the Great Command. Great Command. A lot of you might even know that one. But it's uh, Jesus quoting um, the, the author of Matthew is doing the eyewitness account of Jesus as he's quoting the Old Testament. Well, to them, it was just the scripture. They didn't have Old and New, right? But Jesus was there. He was quoting the scroll from Deuteronomy. We're going to talk about both of those passages today and how those connect together. We're going to talk about why we not only do we serve here in Greenfield in our community, but why that we should serve there overseas. We're not just going to do it. We're explaining why we do what we do. So let's look at the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, starting in chapter two. Paul's got something powerful to say through us uh, to us, and it was written two thousand years ago to a church, you know, not here in America, but man, it is really important for us to grasp this truth. I have worked in several churches. I've been in different spots from youth pastor, worship leader, assistant pastor. I've been all over big churches, small churches, medium-sized churches, and here is something that is uh, common in all those areas that at some point in the life of the church, people begin to come and want their own thing. They want their own preferences. They begin to rumble and complain about the style of music the messages that are being preached, and they forget their first love of following Jesus. And at this point, you're supposed to go and then make disciples, or make disciple makers, like we talked a few weeks ago. But what, what happens is, a lot of times we just come to church and we sit. And then we become these things that really are not what God called us to do. God never called us to come sit in church. He wanted us to go and make disciples. But what happens is, and I think the devil has a lot to do with this, um, the scripture says, don't give the devil a foothold. So even inside a church space, what happens is we begin to be selfish. Because what we like, what brought us to church in the first place, you know, we, they, maybe it starts shifting and the music changes or the style changes or they paint a wall, heaven forbid. And they go, this is the wall that my great-grandma donated the paint for back in 1934. And people get so upset. And, you know, it, it sounds funny. They equated their spiritual journey with this thing and not Jesus. What do we talk about when I do those circles? You remember, Jesus is Lord. Not the pain of Jesus. Is Jesus the center? Is the focus of worshiping Jesus? That's the main thing. And we, we lose that uh, when we start to worship other things. And again, that can be preference, styles of music, and, and programs. Uh, I was at a church one time that they, they did an activity, uh, this um, pancake breakfast. And no one can remember why they did it. 
They, this is what we always do. We just pancake breakfast, and all they were doing was serving the, the church people. The church people come, and they eat, they eat pancakes. Great, we're all fellowshipping. But there was a million other things they could do. But the, the, the original, we got the heart of it, the original idea was to get people that couldn't afford breakfast to come in off the streets and have breakfast and engage in conversation with them. And then over the years, the decades have gone by, and now you only they start charging huge amounts of money to begin this fundraiser um, to help you know do all this stuff, and they just lost the focus of Jesus being Lord. They began to worship the program. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to be very careful when we are doing things. And then what happens is everyone has to get in their own little silos. They like their own little thing. And Paul is talking about here in this in this letter to be unified, to be one. So if we're going to be a church that is doing mission work locally. And globally, we've got to be on the same page. And this is what Paul is talking about. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, and t any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being what? Like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. It doesn't mean... That you have to have exactly the same preference and style and opinions. It is, it's not saying that. He's saying put those things as secondary and keep your focus on Christ. And we all can relate. It doesn't matter what songs we sing, what kind of style we do this or whatever. The walls are painted as long as we're all in one accord worshiping Jesus. Amen. Amen. I missed um, the show Band of Brothers when that came out. I, I, Tom Hanks and... Uh, Spielberg produced this thing. I found it like last week uh, on Netflix. I'm like, I, I kind of like more stuff, so I watched it. It is, it's, first of all, it's just a great, it's a great show. Um, it's a little bloody if you don't like war stuff. I would stay away from it, but it's pretty graphic. But these guys were, they were bonded in blood, right? They dropped in Normandy. These are the, sort of the paratroopers, and they lost so many soldiers that first night. You know, spoiler alert, I think they win the battle. I think I, you know, I don't know. This is how I learned history by watching movies and TV shows. Um, but they they do these impossible missions. The Nazis have well overwhelmed them with numbers, but yet this band of brothers come together uh, and they defy odds. Yes, they lose people along the way, but they defy odds and they they achieve their mission that is given to them by their commanding officers. And then when their commanding officer is one that can be trusted, they are invigorated, they are together, and they have their brothers, and no matter what they're going through, they're able to accomplish their mission. It's the same thing with church work and ministry. If we are united with our marching orders from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there is nothing that we can't do. The scripture says the gates of hell, well that's the country, you hear that? Hell uh, will not prevail against us. That little girl's not here so I can say hell today. Did you guys hear that? She's like, oh! And I was like, you're right, I'm sorry. This, this church is God's plan A. Okay, There's no plan B right now. Um, it is us. Jesus is going to come back and right now we are the hands and feet of Christ. All right? We're supposed to be in one mind, so if you can't agree on things, at least agree on that. If you guys seen a, if you're like college basketball like me, you can see teams that are very me focused. There are players that just kind of want to go to the NBA, and so they're worried about their stats, their rebounds, their shot percentage, their points that they're scoring, versus other teams that are trying to win a championship. And they're like one mind, one. They 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 got their um, offense from their coach, and they're executing this half court offense. They're scoring. They're playing defense. They're switching things around versus these teams that just do isolation. Uh, and the one player tries to get do all, all the work and make sure they go to the NBA. It doesn't, doesn't matter if his teammates go or not. We can't be that kind of basketball team. <clears throat> Church. We can't be just looking out for ourselves, what we like, what we prefer. We've got to be in one mind, focused on what God wants us to do. Verse 3 says, I mean, this. if we could just get this right here, like if we could just grasp verse 3 and 4, we could walk out the door and, and be good. We're not. We'll keep going. But here, listen to this. Do nothing... Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being, very, being in very nature God, Jesus was God, okay? He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to what? Death. Even death on the cross. When we are asking you to get involved with missions, most of you are not going to die. Okay, we're not. You're not going to. You're not going to you know, take a bullet for this. Um, you might have to give some dollars. You might have to give some time. You might have to give your energy, your your resources, your energy, your your uh, you know whatever it is you're going to sacrifice to do. And but listen to our model, Jesus, who is God in flesh form. If anyone was worthy to be served, it was Jesus. Jesus chose to take on the form of a servant, and he even died for us. And that's what he's asking us to do, is to, to live under his example and his teaching. Even the word Christian, right? I mentioned this a few months ago. Like the word Christian was a slang. It was a, 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 um, a, fun, a term that they were making fun of these people. Ooh, look at the little Christ. That's what Christian means, little Christ. Ooh, look at the little Christ. Look at the little Christ. And then we took that as a badge of honor and said, yeah, that's exactly right. I'm, I want to be like Christ, I'm perfect. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to try to be like Christ who was perfect. And we follow his teaching. We follow his commandments. We follow what he said, uh, what, what is said in God's love letter about Jesus. And we try to do our best to live for him in all that we do. I'm not crying. <laughs> but I know that I come up short. I know that I come up short when I look at the life of Jesus, the one who is worthy to be served, chose to be a servant for me. For all that I've done, all those messed up things that I've done in my life, that Jesus loves me this much that he's able to die on the cross for my sins. That's why we serve, guys. That's why we serve, because Jesus served. The big idea of the day, the, the here to there today, is that loving God fuels our love to share with others. When we're in in like on the fence about, man, should I get involved? Should I do this? Think about what Christ did for us. Loving God fuels our love to share with others. The first point to ponder, there's only going to be two. The here, it's a here and there. Everyone's going to be here and there. This week is here, vertical with God, and there with other people. Number one, here, our love for God. Our journey starts here in the very core of our beings. It's having a personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, I would I would dare to say, like, we need to make sure that's step number one. Like, you know, you need to do that first. If you haven't done that, please see me. See Pastor Joshua. See Pastor John. Um, or see, it doesn't matter if you can see Jacob. Okay, he knows Jesus. It doesn't matter. You don't have to have a ministry degree to lead someone to Jesus, right? You just need to be able to share the love of Christ with him. So if you haven't done that yet, that's step one. It's not just about knowing him, are following a set of rules, or doing X, Y, and Z. It's about falling deeply in love with Jesus. If you've been in a relationship, think about when you first fell in love, and they could do nothing wrong, right? You know, I wish we could get back to that. Right? You could do just nothing you could do wrong in their eyes. You have these rose-colored glasses, they say. And we need to keep continuing to, as we try to pursue our spouses and the people that we're in a relationship with, the same is true with our relationship with God. When we first come to Jesus, we're on fire, we're excited, everything looks amazing. And then we kind of get into the nitty-gritty of church ministry. And the church is great, but there's people in it, right? And when there's people, there are problems. And we like, oh, we begin to look at people instead of Jesus, right? Even instead, you don't look at the pastor, you look at Jesus. You don't look at the small group leader or whatever. You have to look to Jesus, he's the only perfect example, and it's about really falling in love with him more and more and more. Ask yourself the tough question, is my heart growing closer to Jesus or going further away? Am I falling more and more in love with Jesus? How do we do that? We have to spend time with one another. we got to listen and talk, not just talk, but to listen, share, read his word. The love we share with God is the kind is the, is to wake us up in the morning and say, okay, everything else might really stink, <laughs> but I've got this. I've got purpose in my life. There's a mission in my life. God loves me so much that he would die for me. So that's enough to get up out of bed and keep going. It's about deepening our love of God. When we're falling more and more in love with God, it's easier to serve other people. 
It's difficult. And if you find yourself going, ugh, ah, ugh, ugh, this makes me so ugh, ask yourself, are you really falling more and more in love with Jesus? Because if you begin to love somebody, you begin to do the things that you do. I never watched Survivor before Brooke. Never! I didn't like it. I was like, it's like reality TV, and they're like, oh, so I'm wearing the red buff, and she's wearing the green buff, and I don't like her. And I'm like, it's drama! Dude, I love it now. I love Survivor. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine my life without having Survivor in it now. I can't, I can't imagine. You know, we get, we watch it, we record it, and we make sure we eat dinner sometimes. Put the kids to bed early so we can watch the DVR record Survivor. Before Brooke, I would have no idea what that was like. I could care less. But now I'm doing the things that she loves to do, and then I fell in love with things she likes to do. She watched the whole Kentucky basketball game with me last night. The whole thing! She fell asleep at the very, very end. But she was there. And before we were in that it was like, ah, it's kind of cool, whatever. But now we do the same things. We love some of the same stuff. The same thing. If you are in a relationship with God, you're going to find out very quickly that he loves the world. Right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the people that looks just like us. For God loves the people that votes like us. Is that what the scripture is? No. For God so loved the world. And if we fall more and more in love with Jesus, we're going to do what Jesus is doing. We're reminded in the great commandment in Deuteronomy, it's about fully immersing ourselves in his presence. It's about letting his word soak into every fiber of our being. That we can't help that. We are just overflowing in love with God. It's allowing his Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts and actions. When we make decisions, we're doing it through the lens of the scripture and what God would say. Is it which movie to watch, what movie not to watch, what joke to be a part of, what joke to leave the room for, when to gossip, which is never, right? Right. It helps us say yes to things we need to say yes to and no to the things that we need to say no to. It's not passive. It's not just a punch your clock, get your Jesus juice every Sunday morning at 10. It's a 24 hours a day, seven day a week relationship. Like, it'll be awesome when you're married to be like, I'm checking it out, see ya. Be back tomorrow, 8 a.m., we'll do it again. No, that's not marriage. Marriage is like, it's, it's 24-7. Imagine, and parents, I would love to be like, we take, we take our kids to Grammy and Poppies. Woo! That's an amazing feeling. Then they bring them back. And it doesn't stop. We have to take care of them all the time. I always think about how God, like, is up there and, like, you know, I used to complain and be like, oh, God, you know, you're so busy. Why are you? We don't, st- as a parent, you don't ever stop. Even with the with Grammy and Poppy, we want text message updates. We don't know that they're doing okay. We're constantly can care, caring about them and loving them. We want to make sure they're safe, having a fulfilled life. What is God doing for us? God wants you, our new father, to have this amazing life. And we come up short, and God forgives. We come up short, and God forgives. We come up short, and God is there like a heavenly parent. Not like is a heavenly parent. It's not passive. It's a love that's seeking to know God more to understand his heart, and to live out his desires in the world. How do we do that? One quick way is you spend more time with him. We talked about that in week one of our last series. You just spend more time. If you're spending five minutes a day, try ten. Try six, whatever. If you're doing zero, try one. Grow that time with God. Read his word. Don't let it be passive. Don't let it go one ear and out the other. Make a change and then live that out. Our love of God matters. This deep abiding love for God isn't for our own benefit. It's the source from where our his love overflows into our life. We've said this a bunch too. You can't pour out of an empty cup, right? No, you have to pour. A lot of people say, you know, just come feed me. I'm going to come to church and you feed me. I don't get this big, thick message. I want, you know, I don't want uh, milk. I want this steak. I want this meaty message from God. And I want, and they do nothing with it. We're supposed to be fed, absolutely. But it's to go serve. It's to take what we're hearing and learning and go apply it into our life, not just do our own thing for the other six days and 23 hours and then one hour we check in. It's about making a life that's consistently falling more in love with God and actually living it out. When we are filled with love for God, we can't help but share that overflow in our life. But when you begin to feel burnt out, you begin to feel like, oh, i got to do this again, check yourself. Are you falling more and more in love with Jesus? That doesn't mean that every time you're like, yes, get to get up. You know, it's snowing. I'm going to go outside and go to church. Like, there's, there's times like you're like, oh, my goodness, I wish I could just go to the church with the Holy Governor, you know, and roll over in bed. It'd be great. Sometimes we actually have to do things that we don't like to do. Like, can you imagine you know, if your husband or wife said, hey, could you go to the store? You're like, eh, forget it. I don't really feel like it. 
Go to the store. You know, but sometimes we just have to do some things because we love the other person. It's the same thing with God. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for the share conference that's coming up, I want us to start now, three weeks out, praying for this. This is the season of Lent. And by the way, it started last on Wednesday. It's the season of, prep, of preparing for Easter. And so we're doing like a mini preparation for the next preparation, which is three weeks uh, of this share conference. And as we begin to prepare for this, thinking about how we're going to serve here and how we're going to serve over there, it starts with a single step, and that's getting closer to the heart of God. We're starting to do more than just listen to songs, do more than just listen to a sermon. It's time to, as a church, you know, it's been six months, right? We've been establishing systems and kids' ministry and background checks and tech ministry, all these things, connect groups that are going to, by the way, they're starting March 17th. That week, connect groups are restarting, so be looking for those signups coming soon. We can do all those things, but now it's time to live out our purpose of connect, grow, and share. Now it's time to not be so church, us, us focused. It's time to turn that out to do both here and there. It's not just one way, it's both. So the second point to ponder is there, our love for others. As we transition from here, that deep personal relationship with God, we then look towards helping other people. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where, this kind of, I was joking about the real Christians coming to church today, but this is where it kind of separates out. There are people that say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I was in Egypt um, 2010 or so, and I was uh, there for a, uh, uh, my, for my seminary. I was doing like a mission work, this 10-day mission thing. We were doing like church planting and uh, encouraging pastors that were church planting in homes over there. Um, but we had one day of sightseeing with this museum, and I was in this museum with a couple friends, and this guy comes over, he goes, oh, you guys are Americans. I'm like, how could you tell? Uh, and I'm like, yeah. And he goes, oh, um, what are you here for? I'm like, well, we're doing pastor training for whatever. He's, oh, um, you, you're a believer. And I said, yes. He goes, are you a follower? I, said, I just said yes. He goes, no, no. Big difference between believer and follower. That's a really bad Egyptian accent. But there's a big difference between believing in Christ. The demons believe in God. Are we a follower of Christ? It's a big difference. And that really convicted me. I was like, yeah, man, yeah, I, I absolutely am. I'm a follower of Christ. Oh, good. Let me pray for you. This guy wasn't anybody. He just was a, he wasn't part of our convoy. He wasn't part of our thing. He was a Christian in a Muslim country. Um, and man, like that, he prayed for us. And I mean, that's what the Holy Spirit sent an angel um, to us. And we were kind of dragging towards the end of our trip. So it was a big boost for us as well. But man, it was convicting. You know, are you a believer? Are you a follower of Christ? Because if we're going to be genuine, we have to reach other people. Because that's what Jesus told us to do. Amen? The disciples were hanging out with Jesus. And they asked him, this is in the book of Matthew. He said, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And so what does Jesus do? He quotes to them that scripture that I mentioned in Deuteronomy. You know, some people say, well, Jesus didn't really, uh, you know, he didn't talk about the Old Testament. Jesus didn't care about the Old Testament. Yes, Jesus very much cared about the Old Testament. Jesus quoted the Old Testament. He said, here's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment here. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I say this all the time. Everything that we do, even a Super Bowl bowling event, everything that we do uh, in our church hangs on one or two hooks. Loving God or loving others. And a lot of times they're, it's, it's, it's both. Loving God and love the others. All the, Jesus, all that, the scrolls, all the scripture hangs on loving God and loving others. Loving others as ourselves echoes the second part of the great commandment. It's a natural overflow, like we mentioned before, out of our heart of God. This isn't about the superficial affection or a temporary kindness or bless you, brother. You know, it's really about this profound selfless love that seeks the best interest for others, even when it costs us something. That's when it gets hard for a lot of Christians. They go, oh yeah, I love people and I'll, I'll help whatever I can, but I mean, it's going to cost me something? Yeah, Jesus laid his life down for us. What is he calling you to do? It's probably not to lay your life down. It's probably to lay your streaming service down, maybe. 
Uh, maybe it's asking you to um, come go out and help people on the side of the road that need a, a tire change. Maybe it's something as simple as smiling at someone working at the post office. God will tell you. If you pray the prayers that God, show me who to love. Show me who you have for me. Show me who you want me to reach. Who do you want me to invite to church? Who do you want me to invite to know you better? And, and say, Lord, just show me. Be careful. God will answer that prayer. If you're doubting, like, oh, I'm not sure my prayers are being answered. Pray that prayer. God, show me someone that I can help today. You're going to get that nudge on your shoulder. You have to choose to accept it, though. It's the hard part. That, again, that's where the rubber meets the road. Jesus laid his life down for us. This means serving, sharing, and loving without reservation. Loving others isn't easy. It involves stepping out of our comfort zones. Again, it's easy to do it. The people who look like us and think like us, and act like us, vote like us, all those things, you know. But when they're outside of those things, they may seem unlovable. They're difficult. They're cantankerous. They're mean even. That is difficult to love them. But we don't love them for us. We love them for Jesus, expecting nothing in return. That kind of love is that love that, that Paul talked about in Corinthians, that famous marriage ceremony. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't easily angered. It keeps the record of wrongs. That, that kind of love, that agape, unconditional love. Can we share that with other people? Each act of kindness, each word of encouragement, each gesture of support carries with it the potential to change someone's life forever. There could be the difference between spending eternity in heaven or hell just by you stepping out of your comfort zone. You're going to be able to reach people that I'm never going to see, that I'm never going to be in contact with, that they're never going to walk inside this church building. But you have the opportunity in your sphere of influence, in your family, with your neighbors, with your co-workers, to be the love and light of Christ. Our love builds bridges, it breaks down walls, it plants seeds of faith into a beautiful expression of God's kingdom here on earth. And you will agree with me if you watch the news or social media for five minutes. The world is a dark, hopeless place. And we are supposed to go bring that hope and light to others. So as we prepare for share confidence, we have to embrace this mission of God's love and really mean it. Really mean it. Say, God, when I say, God, I love you, uh, he was talking to Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yeah, God, I love you. He said, no, no. Do you love me? Yes, God, I love you. Do you love me? Yes. And actually, we can go, that's the whole sermon for another day, but um, he was saying, Philos, that kind of love, do you love me like a brother? And, and Peter's like, yeah, God, yeah, come on, let's go. He goes, do you love me like a brother? Like, like a brother? And yes. And then he goes, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Yes. And Jesus says what? Then feed my sheep. He didn't say come get fed. Over and over again, he says, feed my sheep. If you love me, you will feed my sheep. Our trip from here to there is really just a journey of love. Do you love like God loves you? Let's fully embrace this adventure. Together, being unified in one spirit, like a college team that's not trying to get to the NBA, but win a championship. Let our love for God push us out of our comfort zones to sacrifice something, whatever it is, for the greater good of the kingdom. Amen? And amen. I'm going to have uh, Josh and the band come back up. We're going to sing one more song and we'll close. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to love like you love. We pray today, God, as you convict us, as you push us, as you stretch us into the next phase of our journey, God. We pray as a church and as our families and as individuals. Convict us. Show us who you want us to love, how you want us to love, and when you want us to love. I would pray in advance for next week's message on, on how to do this. When Pastor John's preaching, God, we pray today that you would uh, help us and to be prepared for that as we're going to shift gears now to do, start doing mission work in our church, God. Help us to be not only okay with it, but to be excited about it, to be encouraged by it. And to begin to live in those places that your Holy Spirit is already blessing. God, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. This next song that we're going to be doing is uh, one we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. It's kind of our theme song for this series. And it's called Heal Our Land. It's a prayer.
prayer to God, just asking, Lord, work in our lives. Heal our land. May the world see what you want us to see. May your spirit be breathed on your church. May your presence be poured out so that everyone, no matter where they are, might know that you and you alone, God, are our salvation. Let's stand and respond to him today. Take our lives, Lord, yet beautiful. Restore, refine, Lord, your merciful. Redeem. We pray in every nation, Christ we know, our hope and salvation, Christ alone, new power, new wine, as the visions fall, one church. through the message. Lord, work in our hearts. Humble us. May we see how we can love you more and more. So that when we love you more and more, you will help us love the world more and more and love others 
who need your love. As we go about this week, Lord, may we feel love for people so strong that we will share with them your word, your love, your desire for them. We thank you, God, for all that you have spoken to us today. Be with us as we go out with transformed hearts. We love you, God. Amen. We're all sent.